Thank you. You may be seated. We'll dismiss the four to eight-year-olds to their class as the Felton family comes for a special link song. Jessica. All right. You guys are famous. Probably make tonight's service go viral. All right. So I appreciate that so much. I know you at home appreciate the music as well. I hope you've been enjoying singing with us and also the special music, the piano, the offertory, things that we've had as well. Um, that is one of the things that you do miss when everybody's not here. So it's been great to be able to sing together worship the Lord together, and um, I'm glad we can do that. I'm glad we can do that. Let's take our Bibles once again and turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Somebody said, why do you split those messages up so many times? I determined a long time ago, I'm not going to just rush through a message just to rush through it, okay? Um, when we preach on messages like um, these particular topics, this is a topical message. Um, normally, I preach expositorily, um, but when we have themes that we've been doing and really trying to stick to the theme for the past few years, um, you do end up preaching topically from time to time, and it's a valid way of preaching. Okay, now I don't think it's the only way of preaching, but it is a valid way of preaching. There's a lot of topics in the Bible, and you take uh, a verse like Galatians chapter 5, uh, and you've got nine different topics to preach on. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and now temperance again here tonight. And uh, you can take it and you can trace it through the Bible. Normally I look at ex uh, Old Testament examples, maybe some New Testament examples uh, through this last series now. And um, then you look at ways that the Bible talks about uh, we fail in this area and maybe ways that we can um, try to shore up this area and gain victory uh, in, these, um, 
in these areas of our life as well. And so um, I don't just feel like we should rush through these kind of things when you're really just trying to take the entire topic in the Bible and uh, condense it down to about, uh, you know, a 40 minute, 45, whatever, okay, um, minute message, okay. Some of you are making, you know, you look at me like I'm a liar, okay. So uh, 30 minute message, <laughs> uh, 40, 45, whatever. Um, so um, that's why I do this from time to time. Uh, now that they are being live streamed, of course, if you ever miss, uh, you can go back and pick that up on YouTube. We have a YouTube archive channel called GBC slash HHCS Media, GBC slash HHCS Media. All of the live streaming that we have done um, since, um, wow, since the pandemic began, the quarantine time, uh, are uploaded to that. Um, of course, we're on Facebook and live streaming through our um, our website as well, gbcmuncie.org. And so let me, by way of review here, just look at Galatians chapter 5. Um, we are on the ninth fruit of the Spirit, the manifestation of the fruit of the Spirit here. But in contrast to the works of the flesh, right? But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and now temperance against such there is no law. This morning, I laid out the case that there were um, consequences to the spiritual decisions that we make as seen in the life of Samson and in the life of Daniel, both men of God, both people that had uh, a plan of God for their life. And Samson was to defeat the enemy and ended up being defeated by his enemy. Daniel gets taken from his homeland and he um, determines in his heart, he purposes in his heart, that he's not going to defile himself with a portion of the king's meat. Samson lives in the situation and does whatever the situation dictates. Daniel lived by the scripture and did what the scripture dictated to him. And so we see that in this area of temperance, in this area of self-control, of, of subduing our passions of subduing our evil propensities, our sin nature, living according to the Spirit of God, living according to the Word of God, uh, we see that there are consequences to those decisions that sometimes we have to make in a split second. I don't know if Daniel had an opportunity to, to really think over his decision when they came in and said, okay, guys, this is what you're going to be eating for the next three years. We know that Samson made split-second decisions and he chose poorly. He really did. And there were horrible results of his casual attitude toward temperance. And then we also saw the honorable uh, reward of Daniel's consistent approach toward temperance as well. I also said this morning that this particular word that is used in Galatians 5.23 for temperance is used four times in the New Testament. It comes from the Greek word that uh, means strong, has to do with strength. And so this is what temperance or self-control is, it is a strength over the passions that would continually rise up within us against and contrary to the Word of God. And so just as we've seen these consequences of the scriptural decisions that we make, I want you to see next here, as we go on with this particular message being controlled by self or the Spirit, the control of our sinful desires the control of our sinful desires. Because when you talk about temperance, when you talk about self-control, really, we're, we're seeking to be controlled by our sin nature. That's the whole deal, right? We don't want to be controlled by sin nature. Rather, we are in control, and we're walking in the Spirit. We're not walking in the flesh, fulfilling the desires thereof. And once again, this is a strong influence in our life when we talk about a sin nature a very strong influence. It has more influence in my life and your life than we would really care to admit. The sin nature that we got from Adam, passed down through the generations to us and now passed on to our own children. It's a very strong influence in our life. And so as we mature in this area of the fruit of the Spirit, especially this area of temperance, and self-control over our evil inclinations, we're really talking about strategies to control these passions. Strategies. How am I supposed to, as a human being, as a person with a very strong sin nature, a very strong self-will, how am I supposed to 
conquer and defeat and have the victory in this area of my life where I need to have and exert self-control over my sin nature and not let it control me. Well, I want you to see a couple of different ways we can do that. First of all, I want you to see the principled restrictions that help us to control our sinful desires. Principled restrictions, Bible principles, and these restrictions that help us to control our sinful des desires. We have looked at Samson and how God placed restrictions in his life. I said this morning that he was a Nazarite from birth. In fact, the angel of God that came to Samson's mom said that you need to refrain from partaking of the fruit of the vine because this child is going to be a Nazarite. He's going to be holy, set apart to God. Folks, are we holy, set apart to God as Christians this evening? We're supposed to be. Okay. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. We know that verse. We're supposed to be a living sacrifice. We're supposed to present ourselves to God for his service. Uh, you, we don't take a Nazarite vow. We don't have any outward symbolism of that as they did at that time. But we also, just like Samson, have been given a job to do. As a Christian, we're to serve God. And just like when Samson, as a Nazarite, not by his choice, but a Nazarite nonetheless, he made his choice to either live under those restrictions or to not live under those restrictions. Now, when you become a Christian, you make a choice. In fact, becoming a Christian is all about choice. You choose to receive Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior. God didn't make us robots. God didn't twist your arm in order to make you trust him as your Savior. You chose with your will. Many times from this pulpit, I said that you cannot get to heaven just because you believe there's a God. You cannot get to heaven just because you had an emotional response to the fact that there is a God and that you are a sinful human being. That has never gotten anybody into heaven because the Bible says the devils believe and tremble. But they chose wrong. They chose wrong. When Satan said, hey, who's coming with me? They went with Satan. They refused to stay with God. And so that is where our choice comes into play in salvation is whether or not I'm going to choose to remain in an unsaved state or whether I'm going to choose Jesus Christ who loved me and gave himself for me as my Savior. And believe God's word that says that if you don't believe in Jesus Christ, you'll never have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that be believeth in me. Though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. That's what Jesus said. And if you're a Christian tonight, that's what you believed. Nobody forced you to do it. Here's Samson. He had restrictions placed upon him and his life if he was going to serve God. And the Bible says that we ought to be also putting up restrictions to restrict our sinful desires. To be temperate is to place boundaries in our life that are based on biblical principles and commands. You know, this is the thing. People are like always wanting to throw off biblical boundaries. They're always wanting to throw off biblical commands. They're always wanting to find a loophole and try to get around God's word and say, well, that obviously doesn't apply to me because I know better. Okay. But nobody has ever been injured by placing spiritual restrictions into place in their day-to-day -day lives. Let me say it again. Nobody has ever been injured by placing God-ordained, godly principles from God's word into place in their life on a day-to-day -day basis. But I tell you this, there have been many people destroyed by not placing boundaries around their life that are meant to keep us safe. Self-control is about observing these barriers that keep us from the danger of giving in to our evil inclinations. And so that's when you start getting to talk about rules, okay? You talk about rules and you talk about policies, you talk about standards, you talk about convictions, and all of this comes into play and, and, and biblical principles. The Bible is not a list of do's and don'ts, folks. There's plenty of commands in the Bible. If you want to know a, a certain thing, whether it's right or wrong, there's probably a command about it. But I'll tell you this, there's a lot of things that we do because of biblical principle. 
biblical principle. There's no way that the Bible could codify every single possible situation that you and, you and I would find ourselves in as human beings and saying, I wonder what's right or wrong to do in this situation. There's no way. It, I mean, that'd be the hugest book. I mean, it'd be something that even Congress couldn't write, and they keep trying. You ever seen those books that they have that are about this tall off the, off the table? I don't even know how they look at that. Of course, you've got to read it to find out what the law is. <clears throat> but I digress. And so rules, policies, standards, convictions, these are all concepts that we wrestle with, but we've got to implement in our lives if we're to observe a Christ-likeness when it comes to temperance. Paul said that many times it is seen in what I'm going to say appropriateness. Look over in Philippians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Just a few pages over. Philippians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. What's Paul say here? Sorry, Philippians chapter 4, verse 5. That's an L in Philippians. I thought it was a 1. Philippians 4 and verse 5. Yeah, I knew that wasn't right. Philippians 4 and verse 5. Paul says this, Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Let your appropriateness, your, it, it's a gentleness here, but let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. The Lord is nearby. Okay. They ought to be able to see that. He said in Romans chapter 13 and verse 14 to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Folks, when we talk about these kind of restrictions, these principled restrictions that help us to control our sinful desires and help us in this area of temperance to cultivate this fruit of the Spirit, we're talking about these type of things that he speaks of in Romans 13, 14. Don't make provision for the flesh. Put up barriers. Stay away from sin. Don't play with sin. Don't get near sin. A lot of you have gone down River Road before here and, and at the corner where it tees before you kind of make that jog. There's a house there on the corner and, and that guy has put up a steel barrier and he's got all kinds of huge boulders there in front of his house. And I got to look at that one day after we had first moved here and I said, I wonder, I wonder what that guy's done right now. Well, I'm like, you know, that's because he doesn't want people in his bedroom coming through that intersection with a car and not seeing that curve. And there's a barrier there. There's boulders there. He doesn't want it to happen. You see it on the interstate uh, where they have the barriers that, that keep people alive many times so they doesn't let them cross over the interstate. Uh, there's barriers that people push all the time. You read about it almost every week in the summer where people go hiking out in the Grand Canyon. They go hiking somewhere else and it says don't get too close to the edge. And there's certain places where there is no barrier whatsoever. Just last couple of weeks ago, somebody once again got too close to the edge and fell over the edge. Fell over the edge. It's tragic. I can't even look down on uh, those kind of things. I, I, just, I just can't even handle it. I don't like heights. Okay. You don't have to tell me to stay back. Okay. Man, I'm not going to get anywhere near that. Okay. But you've got people, even with barriers that are up, they'll climb the barrier and they'll go over and they're taking a picture and they fall off. It happens all the time. I can think of like two or three instances in the news just in the past couple of weeks here that that has happened to people. And it's tragic when it happens. But I'm telling you right now, it's also tragic when Christians who know better and we put barriers up in our life to not fulfill the lust of the flesh, don't make provision for it, and yet we climb the fences and we go over the barriers and we go past these principles of God's Word and we're not safe. And we're not exercising self-control or temperance in any way, shape, or form. There are these principled restrictions that we ought to be placing in our life. And, and, and really, the Bible places them in our life. Okay. The Bible speaks of boundaries. The Bible speaks of restrictions that we place in our life. Because temperance is about limiting my flesh. Folks, Paul said, I know that in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Folks, do you realize that your flesh is rotten? That you, okay, in your sin nature, 
cannot even trust yourself. The Bible says in Jeremiah 17, 9, that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You say, well, I just follow my heart. Stop it. Don't follow your heart. Well, I follow my gut instinct. Stop it. Don't follow your gut instinct. It's going to lead you wrong. You follow the word of God. When you become a Christian, this becomes your rule for faith and practice. Nothing else matters. Not how you were raised, not what your mom and dad did, not what your friends do, not what society at large allows you to do. No, this is what we obey. This is our boundary. This is what puts up the barriers. And there are principles in God's word that allow us to do that. You say, Pastor Roy, uh, give a for instance. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul is dealing with the Corinthians once again in his first epistle here because they were really not exercising temperance. And he says this, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Wow, okay. Nevertheless, he says, listen, to avoid. Here's a barrier. He's putting up a boundary. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Is fornication, yes or no, work of the flesh? What? Yes, I want the people at home to be able to hear that if they were confused. Okay. So, nevertheless... Here's a barrier, here's a boundary. To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. And then he goes on to talk about the husband and the wife here and he talks about verse 5 of uh, defrauding not one another and, um, and, and keeping the marriage relationship consistent and tight there. Uh, and then he says here in, in uh, verse 7, For I would that all men were even as I myself, but every man hath his proper gift of God, one after this manner and another after that. I say therefore to the unmarried and widows, it is good for them if they abide even as I. Paul was a single man. Uh, we don't know if he was married before or never been married. There's speculation that Paul was not really handsome. Okay, I don't know that, but there's speculation about that. Okay, um, but th that's neither here nor there. I, I believe there's someone for everyone. Um, but this is what he says in verse 9. This is what I want to show you. Here's a boundary. Here's a barrier. But if they cannot contain, let them marry. For it is better to marry than to burn. Now, folks, he's talking about physical relationship in a marriage. Okay. He says, look, if you can't deal with being single... Okay. He says, hey, it'd be great if you could just abide as me. But he says, not everybody has that gift. In fact, most don't. Okay, that's fine. But there's been, there's been uh, folks that have that gift. They don't, they don't, they're never married. Okay. So that's great. Great way to live, he says. But he says, if you cannot exercise self-control, then let them be married. Marriage is a boundary. Marriage is a barrier. And some of you are like, no kidding. No, oh, no. Okay. Not that kind of boundary, not that kind of barrier. Okay. Marriage is a great thing. Of course, it's a picture of Christ and the church. It's sanctioned by the Lord. But, you know, this is the thing. If, if we can't exercise temperance, if we're not going to be self-controlled and we're going to uh, work off the flesh all our life and never be married, folks, that's, that's fornication, the Bible says, and, and that's adultery. He says, then it's better to marry than to have these feelings that cannot be righteously fulfilled. Okay. This is what we're talking about, these principled restrictions that help us to control our sinful desires. That's one area. I want you to see secondly also, though, this other aspect of personal restraint that helps us to, helps us to also control our sinful desires. Personal restraint helps us control our sinful desires. Now, folks, boundaries are markers that God's word places in order for us to not go beyond. When I'm talking about those principled restrictions, I'm talking about looking in God's word and saying, hey, that's a boundary, that's a barrier that I need to place in my life because here it is plainly in God's word and that's something that I need to implement so that I can have a strategy to have self-control in my life. God's word places those there in order for us not to go beyond. And when we talk about restraint, though, as a strategy to control our sinful desires, 
It's the aspect of self-discipline that we see in God's Word that is commanded. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look over there just a few pages over if you follow me to 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul says, um, uh, let me begin reading in verse 22. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake that I might be partaker thereof with you. He says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all? But one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery, every man that's wanting to arrive at that goal, is, listen, temperate. He's self-controlled in all things. Now they, the athletes that he's talking about, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, he's using a boxing metaphor there, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The word there means disqualified, disapproved. What's he saying here? He's saying that there is personal restraints that help us as Christians, self-discipline, self-control, things that we place in our life, maybe even above the word of God, barriers and boundaries that we will not go beyond. And so we do not have a problem with our sin nature. Case in point, the vice president, Mike Pence, took a lot of heat for telling the, the news media that he's never alone with another woman. He's never in a car with a, without his wife, with another woman. He doesn't go out to eat and just sit there with somebody else. Now, does the Bible say that, that uh, you know, Mike Pence, you got to do that, or any Christian's got to do that? No. And they laughed him to scorn. Well, pretty much all of Washington and all that Capitol Hill, man, I, I don't even, I don't even want to say it. They're just, yeah sinful okay. wrecking marriages divorce and all kinds of things it's hard to find somebody who's been in politics very long that has a stellar record in this area it's hard to find okay. Mike Pence said you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna have this personal restraint in my life I'm gonna make sure that I don't cave into my evil propensities my sin nature and I'm going to put this into place in my life so I can control my sinful desires through personal restraint, self-discipline he's talking about here. Paul is using an athletic term here. Okay. He says that he brings his body into subjection, not the other way around. You master yourself by walking in the Spirit, by feeding the Spirit. By not feeding the flesh constantly. Folks, if your diet all the time is stuff that you ought not be watching, things you ought not be listening to and reading, and, and, and you're, you're looking at things and, and on the computer and stuff, and it's, and it's filling your mind and your heart with all this kind of stuff, that is not walking in the Spirit. It's fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Be very careful with the electronics that we have. Be very careful with your young people with these things. Paul says that those athletes who want to win are exercising self-control in verse 25 there. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate. He's exercising self-control in all things. I don't know a lot about this. I don't consider myself to be an athlete. I played some sports in the day, but uh, that was a long time ago. But these athletes, these Olympic-type athletes, I feel sorry for them that they're not going to be able to go over to Japan this year and, and be a part of those things. I mean, you, you peak at some point, and you're getting ready in, in, in your um, various sports and things like that. And, but what they eat, how they sleep, various things that they do throughout the day, they give up so many things in order to win a gold medal to break a world record, to break an Olympic record. We have sports science down to literally a science. It's science fiction. They know exactly how you, what form you should use in order to run the fastest. 
They know everything about the particular sport that they can ever study. And they are temperate, they're self-controlled in every area of their life. Folks, look at your life right now and ask the question, in my Christian life, as I seek to serve God and walk in the Spirit, am I self-controlled in every area of my life? Or is there an area in my life that is out of control, that I yield to temptation in, that I give over to the devil in? I'm not self-controlled. Paul speaks of a race. He's speaking of boxing here, and he says here that he does not waste his energies on those things that would not produce the desired results. And you know as well as I do that when you are exercising self-control in order to achieve a goal, whatever goal that may be, then it's not worth it to you to waste some time or waste an energy or, or, or waste calories or whatever the case may be on something that's not going to give you the desired results. He says all of his efforts were directed at the grand purpose of subjugating his enemy, which was sin. All of his efforts. And the, and the sin and the corrupt desires of the flesh. And that's different from the boundaries that we set up. Okay? This is self-imposed discipline that understands the goal of Christ's likeness. Folks, every single one of us as Christians should be going toward the goal of looking like Jesus Christ. Looking like Jesus Christ. Acting as Jesus Christ would act. That's our goal. By developing the fruit of the Spirit in this area of self-control and subjugating the works of the flesh. This is our strategy here. This is the control of our sinful desires by these principled restrictions from God's word, the barriers and the boundaries that God sets up, and then also these personal restraints that we put into our life and says, you know, I understand who I am. I know where my weaknesses are, and I'm going to make sure that there are things in place that I am exercising self-control in. Maybe it's something where you need, you know, a person that you're responsible to. A person that you can come to and say, you know, I'm struggling right now. And there's accountability there. That's also a biblical principle. That we would go to one another and confess our faults one to the other and, and bear one another's burdens. And help each other with the sin load that they carry. Be there for them. I could go on and on about that. But thirdly, I want you to notice this. The consecration of our sanctifying devotion. Do you know what temperance is all about? Temperance is really based upon my personal consecration to God and my submission to the Spirit's sanctifying process on a daily basis. Now, I've been preaching about this on Wednesday nights uh, in the elective class that I've been doing. We live streamed most of those. But temperance is dependent upon my personal consecration. I had Pastor Halleck sing the song tonight, Take My Life and Let It Be, Consecrated Lord to Thee. And that song talks about my hands and my, my feet and my lips and my love. Everything that I am is consecrated, is given over to God. Because if we're not consecrated, which means to be set apart for God's use, then there will be no self-control. There's no willingness to have self-control. If I'm not consecrated to God and given over to Him and saying, Lord, I want to walk in the Spirit. I don't want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. I don't want to go against Your Word, Lord. The influence of the Holy Spirit in my life, in your life, it, it makes us moderate in all of our indulgences and teaches us to restrain our passions. It teaches us how to govern ourselves and how to subdue inordinate affections. The consecration of sanctifying, of our sanctifying devotion. The sanctification process whereby I am becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Therefore, if any man be in Christ as a new creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new, right? And so in sanctification, I am setting myself apart from sin and setting myself more for God's use. Being set apart from sin and set apart to God. That's basically, in a nutshell, what sanctification is, except it is a lifelong process. It doesn't just happen overnight. It doesn't happen instantaneously. It is a process that the Spirit works on me and you, and He matures us in these areas of the fruit of the Spirit. He matures us. I want you to see, first of all, that a temperate person understands that they are God's possession. 
A person who's self-controlled understands that they are God's possession. Look back in 1 Corinthians here. We're still in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. If you're still following along, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9. Paul says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Don't lie to yourself. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, that's the homosexual crowd, and so is, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, and such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Those are all great theological terms. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Our sins have been forgiven. We're sanctified. That's that process. We're justified. We are given a right standing before God in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Then he says in verse 12, all things are lawful unto me. So I can do whatever I want. I'm going to heaven. And this is where Christian liberty gets in the way sometimes. You got to be careful about who you're listening to and who you're reading out there. Who you're watching on the internet, whose podcast you're listening to, because there's a lot of this going around. And they totally ignore what Paul says here. And I don't know how they get over it. Makes me mad, actually. Gets me carnal. All things are lawful unto me. But all things are not expedient. That means they're not the best. All things are lawful for me, but I will not, listen, be brought under the power of any. We're talking about temperance here. We're talking about self-control. And Paul is like, you know what? I am not going to be brought under the authority, under the domination of anything just because I can. Just because I can. I can, but you can't. It's not in the Bible. This is in the Bible. He says, I'm not going to do it. Verse 13, meats for the belly and the belly for meats, but God shall destroy both it and them. What's he saying here? He says, look, now the body is not for fornication, but the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God hath both raised up the Lord and will also raise up us by his own power. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? God forbid, he says. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to a harlot is one body? For two, saith he, shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. And so he says, therefore, flee fornication. Verse 18. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. And he gives the principle here in verses 19 and 20 because he says, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which, is, which ye have of God? Listen, and ye are not your own. You're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. God owns you. God owns me. If you're a Christian, Jesus Christ purchased you with his precious shed blood. And we're not our own. And so, therefore, a temperate person understands that they're God's possession. Okay? They understand that I don't belong to myself. I don't get to do whatever I want to do. There's this aspect of consecration to God that says, I am God's. I'm not my own. And so therefore, I must exert self-control and discipline in my life, governed by the biblical boundaries, governed by personal restraints that I put in my life to control my sinful desires. I'm not in charge. I'm not calling the shots. I've been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ, and now I belong to him. So therefore, the Bible says, i got to glorify God in my body and my spirit, which are God's. In my body, the outward things that I do, the things that I allow to happen to me, the things that I engage in, my actions. In my spirit, that's the inward things. My thoughts and my opinions and attitudes. I've got to glorify God in every aspect of my life, and I am not my own. I am possessed by God. He owns me. He owns you. And so if I can't control my mind 
because of what I'm putting into it, then I need to exert self-control. If I cannot control my body because of my walking in the flesh all the time and feeding my flesh because I lack self-control, then I'm not glorifying God. And if I'm not glorifying God, then why am I here? Why are you here? We're here to glorify God. Our kids need to understand that we're here to glorify God. We're not here for ourselves. I'm not here to do whatever it is that I want. I'm here to do the will of God, to present my body a living sacrifice that's holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. My life is not mine to act how I please. My life is not mine to respond how I please, to have my own opinions, to have my own thoughts, or even have my own reasonings. Say, Pastor Roy, wait, 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 hold the train. I'm my own man. I'm an adult. I can make my own decisions. I'm my own woman. I've been on my own for years. What are you telling me that I don't have my own opinions and thoughts and, and reasonings? Man, that's, that sounds like uh, mind control or something, Pastor Roy. You're exactly right. It is mind control. This is what Paul says. You say, that's not Bible. Well, I beg to differ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. You can look it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Paul says, casting down. That Greek word means to demolish. Casting down imaginations. That word imaginations is the word we get logarithm from. It means reasonings, computations, thoughts. So he says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bring into captivity every thought, every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do we get to have our own thoughts? Uh -uh. Do I have an opinion that differs with the scripture and I... I'm a free thinker, I'm an American, I do what I want, no. Am I able to reason outside of God's word and say, but this? No. Because we're demolishing those. We're demolishing those. Casting down imaginations, anything that you would think, anything that you would reason, anything that you would come up with in your own mind that does not match up with God's word needs to be demolished. Rip it down and tear it up. Everything that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. If you know God, and you know about God's character, and you have a thought that is not in keeping with God's character or in keeping with who God is, it needs to go. It needs to go. Battle is in the mind. I keep quoting Romans 12, 1, but what's the next verse say? Verse 2. Verse 2 is all about the mind, right? Verse 2 says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're talking about temperance here. We're talking about, we're talking about self-control. We're talking about bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. If we don't take anything else away from this message all day, I want you to take that verse home today. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 5. A temperate person understands that they are God's possession. And secondly, I'm done. A temperate person understands that they have a godly purpose. A temperate person understands they have a godly purpose. Still, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, okay, they have a godly purpose. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore, it says, glorify God. There's my purpose. Glorify God. But also, holiness is also a purpose in glorifying God. God says, be holy as I am holy. You cannot glorify God in the flesh. You cannot reflect God's image to the world around you, to your family, to your co-workers. You cannot do that by not being in control and walking in the Spirit. If you're walking in the flesh, you're not going to glorify God. You're not going to reflect Him to anybody. We're meant to bring glory to God by being holy. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15. But as He which hath called you is holy... 
so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. That's your lifestyle. That's your actions. That's how you live your life. As he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 11. Seeing then that we have all these things, I'm sorry, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. Talking about the end of the world. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Once again, your lifestyle for the word conversation. Not your talk, but your walk. What manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Folks, this is talking about self-control, strength over our passions, and it requires that I understand as a Christian I have a godly purpose. I am called to holiness, and that glorifies God. I've already quoted Romans 12, 1 a couple of times, but Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 2 Timothy 1 and verse 9, it says, Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to, listen, his purpose and grace. It was his purpose to save us. It was his purpose to make us holy. Are we living like that? Colossians chapter 1, verses 20 and 22 Colossians 1, verses 20 and 22. The Bible says, And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. By him, I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated, and enemies in your mind by wicked works, walking in the flesh, yet now hath he reconciled. He's brought you back together in agree into agreement with God in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Why did he do all that? So that he could present you holy. It's a purpose that God has for each and every one of us. We sang that verse, we sang that song, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. That's what self-control is all about. Paul said, and we need to realize this, every day he said, I die daily. I preach a message about that entitled Waking Up Dead. Every single day, Christians need to wake up dead. Dead to self and alive unto God. And if we're going to see this kind of fruit of the Spirit mature in our life as far as temperance, self-control, self-government over our own spirit, over our flesh then I need to realize I'm not my own and that I have a purpose. I'm not my own. I can't do whatever it is I want to do. And I have a purpose to glorify God through a holy life. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one looking around. This is a great message to finish on in this series of Fruit of the Spirit. I may do one more. I haven't decided yet. Say there's no more fruits. I know. Let me do a summary. But I wonder if there's anybody in here tonight that would just simply say, Pastor Roy, I'm a Christian. But something from God's word today has spoken to my heart. Would you pray for me? Can I see your hands all over the auditorium? Anybody at all? Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Pastor Roy, pray for me. Thank you for that one. Anybody else? Thank you for that hand. Anybody else? Pastor Roy, pray for me. Anybody else? Take my life and let it be. We're going to sing that again here tonight. And I, I want you to sing it like a prayer. Think about the words as we enter into this time of invitation. Father, challenge our hearts, convict us, bring about repentance in our lives. Help us, Father, to exercise self-control and mature that and cultivate it in our lives each and every day. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand to our feet. for
going to end the invitation there. Thank you very much for being here tonight. Thank you for those that are live streaming with us as well. Um, we, um, of course, will not meet on Tuesday once again, but uh, we'll be right back here on Sunday uh, for the morning Sunday school and morning service, evening service again. Um, I hope you'll be here for that. Also, don't forget to pray for Vacation Bible School, and I thank you ahead of time for what you're going to do with that ministry this week. We are going to have a short business meeting. We're going to be dismissing a word of prayer. Those that are staying can stay. It will be a ballot vote. I have the deacons come forward that are going to help me out here tonight and um, present this to the church. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time together tonight. I thank you for each one that has come, each one that has uh, seen us on the computer, Lord. I pray that you might just continue to guide and direct in these areas of the fruit of the Spirit in our life. And Lord, that you might be honored and glorified through our lives. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's have our final song. We'll be dismissed for about three or four minutes. Follow, follow on. Follow, follow. I would follow Jesus. Everywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Thank you for coming tonight. We'll see you back in just a couple of minutes.